I just it's very yeah. humid here in Toronto. Just, just to like totally jump off the cliff. So so you know, how was hair and makeup for 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 your main actress? I mean she has such fabulous hair, but it was all like really specific look. Like yeah, that's did just it take hair. a that's it's just her hair. hair. So you just we didn't, didn't brush like, it. You're like, don't brush your hair. No, don't brush it. If anything, we might have put a little bit of like grease in it sometimes because it would be uh -huh. too beautiful, right? Yeah. She has very beautiful yeah. hair. So we'd have to kind of a little bit add some, a little bit of grease to it. it sometimes. Because it's like thick and real, you know, it's like thick. a real presence. There's lots of hair. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, also your actress too. I was watching your film today, which I love. And I was like, wow, her hair is so beautiful. <laughs> I'm like, can I get that haircut? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a haircut for the film. You know, she didn't, uh, yeah, she didn't look like it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm going to, do I, I'm, I'm going to turn off the chat or I'm just ignoring it. I guess I'm just ignoring it. There's like, I, yeah, get, I'm got, I got distracted. I just got distracted by this. Yeah, we had to cut her hair and we had to color it. Um, I'm curious, you know. I think with making the first film, you're, you know, there's like so much pressure to fit. I'm curious how many days you spent on um, shooting it. Um, and the reason I'm asking, because of course you're like, you know, they squeeze you in a really tight budget. And um, the hair was a real problem when I wanted to do a day of reshoots. <laughs> because oh, she was on yeah. to different projects. She just didn't have that hair anymore. Yeah. And then we, and then she was committed to something where I couldn't cut it and color it the same way. So, I mean, I was really lucky that I could use that wig. <laughs> oh, she's uh, really? Yeah, she too, because, yeah, no, because I could hide her hair and it was like this miraculous thing. That oh, the blue actually, wig, the blue wig. The, yeah, 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 the yeah, blue yeah, wig. Yeah, 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 yeah. that, um, yeah. So, so Jasmine, how many days? I mean, I know it's probably uh, like a 18. question. 18. Wow. Wow. Uh, but we did two. Wow. We rock did star. One. Rock star status right here. <laughs> I honestly, I wish I probably could have done we did do a pickup day. We did do one. We shot we the end, the end, end scene on a whole different day because it rained the day we, and that was great. That was good that that happened. So it was 18 and a half, I would say. And then there was a day of just pickup shots of random B-roll stuff where no, there was no actors. It was just like atmosphere stuff. So technically 19, but 18 for like the, with the actors. 18. But that's a ton of, ton of pressure. That's, yeah. that's like really, you know, because you just have a lot of emotional beats to cover. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, we prepped for so long. You did. Okay. So that like, was your way out. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. We had to have that because we didn't have the days or the money. So it's like we prepped for months and months and months and months. That's the only way it was going to happen in that short of time. Wow. Um, so you rehearsed the hell out of it. Rehearsed the hell. Yeah. Rehearsed or like, I, I, I did, I can talk about this too more when, when the questions start going, but there was, uh, there was a big process of prep that was like not rehearsal of scenes, but like improv of character building. So that's, mm. that's what we did. But your, your film looked like, I don't know if it was low budget, but it didn't look low budget at all. Like it was, it looked. I bet, I you know, I bet mine was lower than yours. Uh, I did get 22 days. I really had to push for it. And they also had another day of, additional scenes so because um you know sometimes when um what you learn you shoot your film and sometimes you learn when you get to the end then then you discover something else about the film and i discovered that my beginning didn't 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 work like it was a different film <laughs> so i rewrote the beginning i made it much simpler so that scene that you see before the title sequence comes up like that came just much later i just needed a simple introduction it was like a much more complex beginning in the end it had a bookend um uh oh my god i mean i think i was like i mean i'm <laughs> the numbers that you know my producers asked me not to disclose yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but nobody yeah. ever wants to do it again you know it's like you you get people slaving away for nothing yes and, um yeah you know i mean i worked for free for many years in this film yeah, yeah i think i think my husband probably still hates me <laughs> you know like i mean it's it's a, how do you not have a job for three years you know yeah. how do you only do one project in it basically like what ends up with uh you know low budget yeah. film but thank you jasmine i mean i'm really like grateful to my dp for 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 how she helped create the look so beautiful um, wow
is so beautiful. Every every shot you could print out shots of your frames of your film and put it, put them in frames on your wall because I was just like, this is a photograph. This is like it just every there's so much detail. Um. Anyway, sorry, I don't want to. So, so I guess yeah, let's go to the plan, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, like what it's it's uh, so interesting that our films share so much, and yet you yeah. know it's like almost like we're in a diff opposite. We yeah. so, so have so much in common, but we shot it in different, very different styles. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. yeah, you know, like that, you know, that I I love, uh, and then and then I don't do what what you do. I don't do so. I'm like I was like ah. It was so fun to see this, like all this movement and being so close and then be like in that body. Yeah, but um, I want to do more of the way you shoot <laughs> I, I, going I forward. I want to do what you do. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I, yeah, I wanna, yeah. I want to do more of that. Like I want to have less mobile camera and more actually locked off. So like that's the next the next projects. That's what I want to do because I haven't done it and it's, um, mm -hmm. I really love films like that. I really, I do. I just haven't made any <laughs> myself. Yeah, it's it's like sometimes the script, right? It calls for certain things. Yeah, so so right. it's not like it's. Uh, I mean, I know some. Uh, there's an expectation from the author that you will repeat your your. You know, you will have a signature style. But I think we're moving. I mean, I hope that we're moving away from it because I really also agree with you. Like, I want to try things that are not. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. so i'm gonna introduce you guys and then, and then we'll let you get back to it yeah <laughs> okay um so uh welcome to uh lockdown film school which is seven throws weekly discussion series with filmmakers in various fields uh this is our 10th session and we plan to keep running lockdown film school through august um next week we are expecting to have emma sante on with us so join us then, um, and you can catch up with past sessions on our YouTube channel, Seven Throw, um, or you can find links on our website, um, and you can also find out more info at lockdownfilmschool.com. Um, so today we have two filmmakers that um, we really, really love um, talking about making their first feature. Um, so we have uh, Daria Zuk, um, who's a Belarusian filmmaker based in New York City. Um, she moved to the U.S. at 16 to study and has since graduated cum laude from Harvard with honors from Columbia University's um, MFA program in directing. And her first feature, Crystal Swan, premiered at the Carlo Vivari Film Festival in 2018 and has since screened at festivals around the world, including the London Film Festival, the Atlanta Film Festival, uh, where she won the Programmers Award, and the Shanghai International Film Festival, where it won the Media Choice Award for film. Um, she strives to tell fun, unapologetically messy stories about always strong, diverse, and sometimes shocking women. Um, that I'm quoting from her website. <laughs> um, <Yay. laughs> and we also have um, Jasmine uh, Mozafari here with us, um, who's a Canadian filmmaker, um, born in Saskatoon, raised in Barrie, now based in Toronto. Um, Jasmine kind of le leapt onto the international film scene with her debut feature, Firecrackers, in 2018. Um, so after the film received Canadian and US distribution, Jasmine won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Director for the film. Um, she graduated from Ryerson University's Film Studies program. And um, before making her fe first uh, feature, she directed short films, um, which include Wave and Sleep on the Tracks. And just this year in March, Jasmine was one of eight writers selected to develop her next feature film through the Toronto International Film Festival, um, their writer's studio. Um, and uh, Orla actually has interviewed both of our guests today before. Um, and our interview with Jasmine about firecrackers appears in our ebook, um, the 2019 Canadian Cinema Yearbook, which is available at canadiancinemabook.com. And actually, we spoke to Jasmine's cinematographer on Firecrackers, uh, Catherine Lutz, on our second episode of Lockdown Film School. So you can go back to that as well um, to check that out. So I'm going to turn it over to Orla now to uh, start our conversation. Cool. Well, um, first of all, to people watching, if you're on Zoom, you can go to the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and um, type in any questions that come to you throughout the throughout the session. And then in the sort of last 10, 15 minutes, we'll turn to those. If you're on YouTube, you can do that in the comments too. But first of all, we're just gonna chat between us. Um, 
I know both of you, I believe, uh, had film school experience. So I was wondering to start off, what do you think you got out of training at film school? And yeah, how did that help you start with your directing projects? Go ahead, <laughs> Jasmine, you go. <laughs> Do you want me to go? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll be go. brief. I would say like what I got, the most valuable thing I got was making a lot of garbage films, like a lot of like shorts that should never see the light of day, but like taught me a lot about filmmaking and like, you have to make mistakes. It takes, a, I think it takes a really long time to become a good screenwriter and a good filmmaker. You need to like make a lot of films and there's people who came to film school already having made lots of films. I never did at all. Like. Uh, so we started with doing like Bell and Howell's 16 millimeter black and white films. And that's where I learned how to like physically cut, trim films, tape it, the film, tape it together, um, put it through a projector and then like learn how to be a storyteller. And I also think the other valuable thing I learned was critique, like having all your, putting your, everything you make up on a screen and have all your classmates critique it is a really valuable experience and it also teach you, teaches you how to communicate your ideas uh, in, through pitching. So all those things over the course of four years um, was good prep for going into sort of the real world. Um, what I didn't learn enough about was the industry side of filmmaking and I think that's something they should teach more, at least in the film school I went to. So. Just to jump off the this, I, I felt like we you know, I my classmates were so concerned with the industry side that maybe I learned too much about it. I tried to stay away <laughs> because I, I kind of knew a little bit. I produced a couple of documentaries before I went to film school. So I knew a little bit like uh, some ins and outs of it um, and was interested only in the creative part of the process. But what you're, Jasmine, what you're talking about, like the, um, you know, communicating your ideas, it's like, it teaches you the language, the language of breaking down dramaturgy and talking about the story and the language of taking notes, the language of giving notes. I think for me, that was the most valuable because I literally, I remember interning for my friend, uh, he had a production house, was starting a production company in, in Hollywood. And I mean, I knew, like I, pro I already knew how to make films, but I really did not understand the language. Like they were speaking some other, some other like birds. <laughs> <laughs> like you know leaning to your character like what like what do you actually mean how do you interpret it like uh, and so, so like having you know a few years of just doing that language like I you know I can I can battle with any creative exec now in, in Hollywood it's like it really makes sense and I could challenge them too because like there's things I've tried in, in writing but that that took that took film school I really did not feel and it, it's something that um you know um adds up adds to your confidence as well like when you really know like you know you really use the language you really tried things out like you, you are also comfortable with uh different scale of projects where i think before film school like, you know you could figure things out you can make your auteur film you can even make your feature film like it's not needed but i think if you are aspiring to be director for hire i would highly recommend film school because like those those uh those big you know the machine it's like it's like built to swallow you in a way and it's like very hard to remain yourself and extra tools like film school definitely help mm. i mean jasmine you said that about you talked about the value of of showing your films to an audience is that something you carry through now like do you do test screenings with your films we do we do a test screening with firecrackers actually at ryerson uh okay. we because the yeah. test the audience I wanted to see it or like to test it on were like 19, 20, 21 year olds. And um, so I did, I did take it there. But uh, yeah, I think test screenings are valuable. I think I also would send it to my peers for notes too, like people who you think uh, will give you good critical feedback, who you trust. Um, so in that way, yeah. And, and that also to me happens way before, like at script level. Um, I won't do sort of a test of that, but I will send it to my peers who I trust will give me critical feedback. So the, the, the critiquing part of filmmaking is such an important part of the process that I think I'm engaging with even more now, like uh, being in these like writer's labs that I'm in is a part of, is critique. Like you, but the, the great thing as you advance is that you have access to people who are 
more uh even more pros at their so like other filmmakers in the world like uh, if you're in the Sundance Institute you have incredible access to to mentors and that sort of thing not that I've been in that but I think just critique is a is a part of it test screenings are a part of making a better film and listening uh to your audience mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it also like it comes with a community. That's what's the the good part about film school. Like I mean, and that's what helps you make your features. People who are you know part of your community who are willing to jump off the cliff and slave away on your set. Uh, you know, in my case, is like that's how I found my DP. Is so she just worked with another classmate of mine who was already much more um, accomplished than I was. Uh, and so like, you know, that we already had a shorthand, you know, because like we had a person in common, like there was already an embedded trust and that community just plays such a big role in, in like pushing, pushing that big, big, you know, impossible project along because I mean, all of these, I mean, the first film is basically an impossible project to, to, to do, like, you know, you probably will get over that mountain, but, uh, but you know, there's a big chance that you won't <laughs> or yeah. that something will go wrong you know it's like uh you know jasmine's film did so 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 well i played a lot of festivals but i mean there's so many films that i love that didn't you know and it's very yeah, that, that it's very it's almost like inexplicable to me sometimes when i see you know like my classmates are so talented and i don't understand why you know why are, why aren't they not making this this like marvelous script that they wrote um, so it's like, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of risk, but, but you have the community to support yeah. you. Yeah. I will say just if anybody's watching who is in high school and is like listening to us and thinks a lot, I need to go to film school. I'll say the other side of it is that some people I know didn't feel like film school was a safe space for them to create based on like the, the, the racism and misogyny that exists in those institutions. So I would say that you don't need to go to film school. Um, I think uh, there, as long as you find a community, like Daria is saying, find a community of people to create with who have like-minded values. And that if, if, if in your, wherever you live, try to somehow get equipment or access to equipment where you can make something small and then, and then kind of critique each other that way. So like do your own film school, but you don't need, I wouldn't say you need to go to film yeah. school, but it's, it's, to me, it was valuable. And in other ways it, it wasn't, but it, it is what you make of it um a lot of the time mm. yeah I mean on a practical level what was the process for getting your first features made and like what challenges did you face in the process of getting funding and organizing it Jasmine I I feel like in in the way you know <laughs> trying to make a Belarusian film you know I I, I I probably often felt like I should have just been Canadian and just should have had you know, there are countries, uh, US not so much, but there are countries in Europe and Canada that have um, certain institutions that support um, support first, a few, first filmmakers, um, uh, debut films. Belarus is not one of these countries. Uh, I think we've maybe had, you know, just this year, maybe we had the second, um, second competition, second of all time. And uh, uh, promptly the winners were canceled. It was just like, I don't know, it was like the other side, crazy side of cancel culture. It's like a very, it's a pre-election time. It's hugely political, like very edgy. And the film that they picked, they, they suddenly decided that it was like too, too edgy. Um, it was based on someone who is, based on a book of the author who is uh, adamantly against the current dictator president who has been in power for 26 years. So, um, so like that was just wasn't an option for me and I had to go around the world. I think like the financing just was such a, yeah, it was, was very difficult because I, I didn't have, I had several countries that contributed uh, and I wish I had, um, on one hand, I wish I had just like this one or two people, two producers or, or maybe one government entity who said like, okay, this, here's your money, you go. Um, I didn't have that, but on the plus side, you know, when you have 10 people who give you 10% of, of your budget, then nobody really has creative control except you. You know, nobody can really tell you. Like they, they have creative consulting rights or they can contribute their notes, but then you don't need to take them because they, nobody has 50, 51, you know, nobody controls. Um, so I, th I think like for me, you know, going, trying to make a film in a country that doesn't really, um, didn't really, that no government entity supported it from the start. You know, I had Belarus film join in very late in the game with some um, barter, um, um, 
that was it was quite challenging um um because i just didn't even know where to start <laughs> you know so it like took some time took some like figuring out um yeah jasmine how was it for you well like you said we're really lucky in canada um that we do have a government entity that helps support filmmakers make their first feature and uh that's telefilm canada and so they'll give um yeah they work with other countries too like in co-productions but for they do have a fund in in my year they supported like 16 or 18 projects and then they expanded it to like 40 50 projects so they'll give you 127,000 dollars canadian and then you can make your film up to $250,000. Like you can make up the rest of that financing, um, which is a small amount to make a feature on. Uh, I don't know what the equivalent of that would be in US dollars, but it's a, it's pretty small, it's pretty tight. Mm -hmm. um, but like Daria was saying, it's so important because we had full creative, like I had full creative control of, of the film and the ownership was between myself and uh, the other key producer, Caitlin Grabham. Mm -hmm. so, that's amazing. So, yeah, that's so important. I don't know. I want people to realize when you're making your first feature, don't give all your um, ownership away and your creative control away. It's really important to keep that. So like this was a, it, it was difficult in the sense that the money needed to like I didn't get paid. Everybody who worked on the film got paid, but didn't get paid their full rate. They got paid barely anything. And um, the other thing was like myself and the producers we're, we're the casting director. We were the location scout. So like, so for me, I describe it as having two full-time jobs at least like four, four months before going to camera where you would, you know, like it, every week, all week you're, you're, you're doing pre-production because you cannot give those roles away to anybody else. Cause you can't pay anybody else to do the casting, to do the location scouting. So that was, that's the difficulty of making a low budget first feature. Sure. Yeah, and not everybody has the means to, 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 to put their life on pause like that, to, to kind of be, especially when you're not taking a fee. So you're re relying on savings and debt and all this other stuff. So um, it's not something I want to do again. Uh, I, I thought of it as like, this is an investment in my future. Um, but uh, there's always going to be, there's always, I think it's always going to be a challenge. Like you're never going to have enough money. I feel like there's always never going to be enough money, no matter how big your budget gets. Um, but it was a good learning lesson. Definitely, Jasmine, I totally feel you about doing several jobs. I feel like I was also doing a producing job because none of my producers spoke the same language. So it was like double, you know, I, <laughs> you know it, it was really, really like I didn't sleep. <laughs> it was super stressful, but that's kind of what it takes. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah, it does, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's stressful enough to to get the film done, but then the distribution of it is a whole different matter. So what was your experience like of, of taking the film to film festivals, showing it to audiences and trying to kind of get it seen? Uh, you know, nobody, also that's another, another side of uh, information nobody really gives you, like how long it takes. Um, I think be between a, uh, the moment I locked the film and uh, we premiered the festival, it was like a good eight months, I would say because we were trying to figure out like what's the best place for us like where can we get in where are we close uh where we're not where it was you know it was like a very much a team decision and uh i have to say before it was completely done i went to several works in progress which were really helpful because that also creates a community and creates a dialogue and people wait for your film to be done and that's super helpful um like i i went you know, there's a really great work in progress in Tallinn. um uh but it's based in european films there's there used to be a work in progress in at tribeca film institute unfortunately i don't know i don't know how they're going to do it if they're going to do it again um, they just unfortunately fired a lot of the people that uh, were there um in new york um so that's like it's just like those are like important moments to uh, you know d develop is you have to talk to a lot of programmers and see where you fit in um so so for me it was quite a process and it was just as stressful as everything else <laughs> waiting yeah. how it's gonna play and uh you know are you gonna get good reviews uh but i mean ultimately you know I, I i wish i knew but now i know like things things work out like you you can also you know you know if you're just going it's if it's taking time like it just needs that time sometimes 
uh, I wish I was less less stressed out about it. <laughs> What's a work in progress? Is it like a, a like a showcase type of thing? It's like a showcase of uh, films that are have uh, or seventy five percent done. I mean, the, every work in progress has different. Um, I don't think TIFF also has maybe work in progress, but these are industry. Um, it's not for the audience. It, there's an industry um, uh, based events. Uh, so you only get, but like it's invitation only. So it's not like you go into the audience, but you can pitch the project or you could show some footage. Um, and then a lot of the times you can win an award that helps you get to that finish line. Um, so which is what we did. Like we did, you know, I went into production not having um, uh, most of my budget. Like I, I just had enough to shoot and I had some money to to start editing, but I didn't have enough to finish. It's just like also another thing, you know, with your first film, um, I mean, you always underestimate. You always think you could do it for cheaper. I don't know, like, because you're, you're wishful thinking. You want to do it so badly that you're like, I know I will figure out how to do this. But you're like, you know, you, you actually probably still need that like extra ten, twenty thousand dollars that you didn't think you needed. Like you need it badly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had the same thing. Like we also just had enough money to uh, film it and start post, but not finish post. Um, we relied on getting into a festival to kind of give, give that like to the post-production house to say, okay, mm -hmm. we have an invitation now from the Toronto International Film Festival. So that gave them more incentive to give us, uh, to make, to cut us a deal to film, to, to make up the rest of the, the money. But it was a struggle. It was like that last piece of financing. Um, in terms of like the experience of going, premiering at festivals, it's like interesting because like Daria said, you don't know how much, you don't realize how the time commitment that also takes. Like, it's just like, you're also like, you're, you're going around, like I went to Europe and the US and Canada. That's mostly where the film did play outside of that, but I didn't fly to anywhere outside of that. Um, you can't, again, it's like, are you able, can you really work if every week you're in a different place? It's, it's not really possible, but that's, I mean, it's like a nice problem to have because again, it's an investment in your future, but I will say like the part of it is audiences like will either usually love your film or hate it. You'll see like if you're in a if you're in a screening at any festival, you'll see people walking out of any film. But when you're the filmmaker in the in the <laughs> States watching that, that's highly stressful um, and uh, strange. And the other thing, like, I think it's great because it helped me with my career. Like at TIFF, I was able to do like that's where I got representation for the first time and I had meetings, but it, it's a job. It's different than going to a film festival as a, as a, as a, like an audience member, which is fun. When you go with your film, it's a job. Like you're, you're there to represent your film. You're there to talk about it. And, um, and, and that's part of it to recognize. And then the other thing is like, you have a lot of good, amazing interactions with people around the world who resonate with your film. And, and on the other side of it, I'm questioning the, the audience makeup of people who go to festivals. Because in Canada, when I toured it around Canada, most of the audiences were like boom, baby boomers. And that's not who I made my film for. Totally. So I do it now when I think about the future of touring with my film, I think I will be a lot more limited in where I like it might play places, but I don't know if I will always go because the, the audience, I don't think it was reaching the audience I intended the film to reach uh, through going to film festivals. So now I, I just, I just question, it's made me question the, um, how the film gets released, depending on what, where the film, like what audience it's supposed to reach. Um, so it's just something I'm thinking about. So, Jasmine, you're so right. I mean, it's a little bit better in Europe. I feel like, you know, you get, you get a makeup, a different makeup, for instance, they also have these university festivals. Like I went to one in France, uh, where it's just young people, you know, and that's, or, or for instance, I, I saw that you got a youth award from a, from an, uh, another festival. I got a youth award in Ireland where it was also just high school. It was like, there were high school students actually going to a festival. So it's like, it takes the festival a certain, uh, you know, a certain push that they want to, they want to draw younger people in. But I have to say, you know, if I were, uh, when I toured in US, uh, it wasn't always the case. Like if you were to go to Berkshire Film Festival, you know, yeah, that's like, over 50 and it's uh or or palm springs you know palm springs are just hugely um prestigious right but it's like you you get a certain type of the audience and then that like influences the reception of course yeah yeah i think europe europe is better i think that's where we saw some younger 
audiences a little bit. And was it hard, you know, like in Toronto, you know, it's such a, it's a, you know, it's a breakthrough. It's an A-level film festival. It's an amazing, amazing place to actually get distribution and get a representation. How hard was it for you to have a conversation with them or show the film? Like, was that, um, did you, did you have a sense that like, oh, wow, they're gatekeepers that like are not allowing me to, to get into the mix? Well, I mean, what I think Toronto, there's always like a lot of films because that festival is quite big compared to some other festivals. Um, it's definitely a festival more of the people than of the industry. It's not like a Sundance or Cannes in that sense, but that's also good. Um, with Toronto, as a Toronto-based filmmaker, you have a hometown advantage because you're, you, like our two screenings sold out fast, but half of the audience, if not more, were people that like knew the cast, knew me, you know, knew the producers. So it, it's like, was it a good representation? Uh, I didn't really use those screenings as like any, it was, there's too much bias in the room, <laughs> like, you know, but um, I think it, it's like we, as a first time filmmaker, it's like, when are you screening? What weekend are you screening? What day are you screening? Because then the industry only flies in on a certain day for the first day and they leave about four days later. And then, but there's still, I don't know how many more days of the festival. So you want to be programmed in those four, first four days. You want to be on this night in this theater and all that stuff. So it's like to get the most exposure and like one one little like misprogramming like if you're programmed outside of that you might not be seen you might not be written about like for us we had a a pr person who got us in the trades before um the festival started which changed everything like having a clip on indiewire changed the level of interest of people who went to go to the press and industry screening and wrote about it in um mostly the Canadian press. So there's like, obviously like, again, it's that hometown advantage that felt there was like, you, you feel like there's a lot of support, but then you realize it's just Canada. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's still good, but, but that's, it's t being a Canadian yeah. filmmaker programmed in TIFF is one thing um, versus being an international filmmaker yeah. being programmed at TIFF. Yeah. How do you cross over? Yeah. How do you take yeah. uh, advantage of that? I, I understand. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Jasmine, that's really interesting because I know that other filmmakers have complained about screening at TIFF. They feel like they don't get supported enough um, and that you get lost among the American films that TIFF is like, well, we have to program Canadian films because we got our funding, but we're not going to do anything to make sure that they get seen. Yeah, yeah, they, that's TIFF, I think most festivals kind of leave that up to you and your PR team to be the mm. ones to generate interest and I and it would, if it wasn't for our PR team, we wouldn't have had any like US interest, but we did have US interest because of that clip on IndieWire. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, you know, people, I don't know how many people come to the festival to see Canadian films, to be honest. Um, that's just, and I, I don't, I don't, I'm not mad at anybody for that. They want to see the films with big stars and the red carpet and everything. So I think that's where TIFF puts their focus maybe more often than not. Um, I don't, I don't know really like how to, I mean, they still do program a number of Canadian films. So it's still like, it's, it's good. I think we're lucky it's in our backyard in a way. Like we have a big festival in our country. That's pretty cool. Not, not a lot of countries have that. Um, so yeah, I think we get, I think we actually have an advantage as Canadian filmmakers because we're going to like, you know, like Belarus is a small country, right? Like, no yeah our film festival nobody comes to it so, so, it's, uh, so it's all good yeah yeah we're very locked in um so you know there used to be that moscow film festival was prestigious but no more you know so i think like for our part of the world i would say berlin is uh yeah. the coolest you know because berlin does like you know by their mandate they have to represent a certain certain number of eastern european films yeah yeah. Mm. But Jasmine, I'm glad you survived the, the, this, <laughs> this, it's, I mean, it's really torturous. I have to say, I remember I was so stressed out. I, I think my film, like, it just didn't feel like a film. I, I remember watching my film at a premiere a screening and I'm like, my God, it's falling into like molecular, like it's falling into pieces. It's not a, it's not a coherent piece. Um, but it's then, so you know, stressful. it's so stressful yeah. to be in the audience. Yeah. 
I, I don't enjoy it. I only did it one time and then I never did it again. I did it at TIFF and then I never sat through another screening after that. Mm. Um, I guess to, to speak to the themes of your film, uh, your films, uh, they're both sort of coming of age narratives about these characters who have a desire to escape these young characters and they have a desire to escape their impress oppressive environment. So I'm, I'm asking, I guess, what attracted you to that kind of story as your first feature? I don't know, you know, uh, or I think it happens intuitively. I'm not sure you like, you know, you don't pick it. It's like you pick something that's close to, I mean, in part, maybe who you are. But I was really attracted to, uh, I wanted to do a story about a woman who wants bigger things, bigger things in life, bigger things and uh, uh, make a difference in the world in, a, in, uh, in, in some way. But I, I, I was surrounded uh, by, by girlfriends like, like my main character and I just thought they were fascinating. So I wanted to explore where, where that's, a story like that would go. Um, these, I mean, you're obviously like often confront, you're confronted by stereotypical uh, women on screen who are like, oh, I just want to get married. I have to say like a lot of scripts that I get and uh, get from Moscow who are bigger commercial dramedies or, or comedies are about like, oh my God, my clock is ticking. You know, <laughs> that's their view of like, you know, how to, how to make um, uh, uh, a film for women. Uh, but, you know, I obviously was, was, um, trying to make something different like that story I felt like I was you know oh something like a, a story that I would want to see on screen when I was 18 20 25 uh, which I didn't get to see so so it was like I was making this for my younger self yeah I also think I was making my film for my younger self and I think I've said that before and I didn't realize that maybe until after the film came out but um for me I'm always like I made a short film called Firecrackers before this. So like, this was an expansion of that. And at the time to, in 2012, when I made that short, it was, it was, it wasn't um, this idea of women being unapologetic on screen was fairly new. Um, and I also was like in film school, I felt that the theme, the voice in within film school was not, was very uh, male centric and celebrated male stories and male adventures. And I was like, by the time I got to fourth year, I'm like, I just want to make a film uh, the way the way I'm going to make it about unapologetic women. And that's what I did. And it felt it felt the most truest to, to my voice. So by the time I did the feature year, a few years later, I still had that. I still had so much to say about that. And I, and I think like Daria's film, it explores I'm obsessed with the idea of freedom, like of, of wanting to be free and what that means. And I think that's just a theme that never gets old and uh i grew up you know like i watched like the virgin suicides and um thelma and louise and and those types of films that really when i was a teenager i remember seeing those and being like this is hitting at something i feel i understand what's being said here so yeah that's it was it was something i wanted to to keep exploring i felt like i had to wake up the world to how toxic patriarchy is not just in men in men but also in women and so I wanted to, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, yeah, the, this, the escape, the, the narrative to me in, in firecrackers is so simplistic and like not important to me. It's more like, what, like, why do we want to leave? What is, what is that representing? What is the, what is the mm -hmm. suffocation of the atmosphere actually representing in a larger scale for every, for a lot of women. So, but uh, there's, I feel like there's so many ways to explore that. And my, my film is just one of one perspective. Mm. Jasmine, you know, it's so it's so interesting. What I'm curious about is, um, uh, you know, so so in a way, uh, you know, your your father comes from Iran, you know, I, I was born in Belarus, and my father was obsessed with the idea of freedom. Um, that is not to minimize, you know, the, our our female <laughs> expression, expression of it. But that's the first time I started thinking about it is when you know, he started talking about it because we all, I obviously grew up in a place that wasn't altogether free. Like there were certain limitations on the narratives that, that you could um, you could explore and, you know, like you couldn't listen to Voice of America. I mean, there's things like you couldn't read, read the news you want. You couldn't write about things, all the things you want to write. So I wonder if you ever, you know, like if if that like if, if that at all influenced 
the way you went into your career? Yeah, I wonder, I, I, like my, the film I'm writing now is a lot more about like my father and, and mm -hmm. his story. And I see parallels in terms of freedom and that exploration. I think like his whole life was trying to get to freedom, you know, in a way. And I think he saw Canada as that place. And yeah, I'm sure that had like a diff an influence that was subconscious that I didn't even realize. But I, when I was watching your film, I liked that there was that layer of learning also about the culture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was the female experience and then Thai, which a lot of people can relate to. And then there was that tie to the culture and how the culture and the place was restrictive, which I found fascinating because to me, that was a bit of an education. It's not something I, I was aware of as much. So I, I like those layers of, of feeling trapped in your film. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that the language, you know, it's interesting. Like, so uh, we we briefly talked about choosing camera language um, in the beginning of the um, of our chat. Uh, that like, okay, wider shots do give you a sense of of um, of being in the place, right? Where where watching your film, I really loved um, um, the this this really visceral feeling of being trapped or being trapped and therefore you know wanting to disappear. Um, um, like, like the, you know, where she, you know, creating these, these very potent metaphors that you, that you went into, like, like, I love, I love your, you know, how she dives in and then actually comes out in a different part of the film, like split, splitting that metaphor. But, you know, that, that fight of your inner self, like it was really wonderful to, uh, to experience it, but with, with using a totally different language, you know, where you're really close and you feel like you could go anywhere and yet you can't um where you know in the frame it's like fun to capture someone because it could be a cage <laughs> but if yeah. you are going with them so you're like almost you allow them you know like they could spring you know your character could yeah. could fly and yet they can't and yet it's so um so so violent you know yeah what they're doing to themselves also like the the you know. but your your even your aspect ratio was was smaller too wasn't it like didn't you shoot it yeah, I shot uh, three by four. Yeah, so it's like a little, you yeah. know, limited, limiting, yeah, and claustrophobic. Yeah. I know you probably, uh, you know, looking at your film, I, I wonder if like you probably loved Fish Tank, which was oh, also God, four, yeah. four by yeah. four by three, <laughs> yeah. right? And I know Andrea Arnold talks about it a lot as like a perfect portrait frame, but for me, it was like a, you know, the cage that I wanted, to, I wanted for her to be caged in. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I liked how you kind of, even you had a smaller frame to work with, yet you always had managed to kind of have like a lot of like, like one of my favorite shots in your film is when um, the lead character is going to look up the address in the phone, in the phone book, right? And, and but then in the, the bottom of the frame, there's a woman with her mirror putting on lip gloss or lipstick. And it, to me, it's like two different two different stories are kind of being told there. Like one about like, I guess like the bureaucracy or like the lack of like, I don't know, maybe I'm not, I'm not correct. Yeah, 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 you're, yeah. yeah you're absolutely. Yeah, it's like layers of bureaucracy and uh, yeah. also very similar MacGuffin. Yeah, like the phone or the, 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 the America, New York or Chicago, you know, it's like, it's like the dream that's never going to come true, but you're holding on to it because it means so much to you that it will allow you to, to progress. Yeah, but that story, another layer. Thank you. Yeah, there's so many shots like that in your film that I thought, like, that's what I aspire to in the future of my filmmaking is not so much to guide everybody to this is what you need to watch right now and this is what you need to watch, but letting mm -hmm. the audience kind of piece together their own, like, their own understanding of what's going on yeah. through different things in the frame. True, but but because you have this, you know, there's a sense that the, these very long shots, you know, I know that like there are like cuts that are hidden or that you don't notice them. You really sense the, you're, you you are there with them, you know, and the time actually the time flows. It's almost like real time. So so it it does it does allow you for for this wonderful experience of of like wow, I want to break out, and it's so satisfying to have the end where they actually go. Yeah, yeah. I can't like I can't describe to you. I was I was so happy to see it. Yeah. But you know something else that are interesting that I noticed about both of our films, um, that uh, our characters don't change. <laughs> yeah, like you mean that their arc. 
Yes, they go through an adventure. They are trying to get what they want. Mine doesn't get what she wants. Yeah. Um, and I can argue, yes, and some, I mean, I've also noticed that some audience, all the audience members think that she doesn't change. Uh, um, but, you know, I was amazed that, you know, with a certain, which is something that's not a traditional, um, not a traditional um, dramaturgy move, uh, which is what I loved so much, is that, you know, her brother, you know he, yes he gets a haircut and maybe he becomes christian but yet he comes back to like wow here's my makeup you know and uh you know uh, the mother's lover who totally lapses and you know their relationship to me is not recoverable again uh uh you know that he be, still is the person everybody's still the person they were before and the you know they tried they tried really hard you know and in you know, like the uh, the only way out is to leave because <laughs> everything yeah. it's like like my character also says like everything will stay the same you know nothing will ever change here yeah you can't grow you can't grow yeah, yeah. that's right mm -hmm. but i thought it was a bold move you know i was like oh wow because it's so often that i think of this um you know do do people change and how easy and how difficult it is to change in real life versus you know, in this Greek version of entertain, you know, film, film on screen, you know, they yeah. change like we are, there's an expectations that that people can change much faster. Yeah, I, I, I'd say like, I think our both our characters change a little bit in the sense of like, um, I, I would say like both of them are very like, there's a confidence and boldness they have at the beginning that I think gets cut down, cut down, cut down True. through different True. experience. Yeah. And they, and they, to me, I, I would say like for Lou, at least she's a shell of herself. Like she, she become like at first everything's so, everything's so extroverted. And she's like, she's, she's so, she's so broken on the inside that the shield she has at the beginning, that's very tough, gets just chipped away at, chipped away at, chipped away at until she's just like, a, like this little child at the end, who's kind of like just lost and problematic in all these ways. But I, I think that sh she becomes quiet. Like at the end, she says nothing. True. So, true, and, I, true. and I thought that similar to your, your character is there's some similarities there. Like at the beginning, there's that, yeah. there's a the confidence in the anime. Yes. And at the end is she becomes very quiet and almost like reflective, I think maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah I think both of them come of age you know that's, <laughs> that's of you know, the, the genre we share yeah. you know in these, these very ways in like in the most impossible circumstances but you they they, they learn the hard way um yeah yeah mm. yeah, yeah true true I, fe I definitely felt that yeah mm. and I was gonna ask you before we turn to Q&A uh one last question which is about um how like the women in your films are really strong-willed and proactive as you were saying but they also come up against a lot of patriarchal violence both physical and emotional so I was wondering how you kind of collaborated with your actors to work out how exactly you were going to show that kind of patriarchal violence on screen Orla, you know, I I mostly collaborated with my um, DP on how to show it. We've had some discussions. I have to say that Alina, as wonderful as she is, she like didn't really have a stance on the on the <laughs> on the feminist radar. She she was like, you know, I think I think only much later we've had like a better understanding with her because she she grew up in in a place where that just wasn't a discourse. So, um, like like. Um, you know, I, I think my male male actor had a lot more respect and um, understanding of, of of the issue we were dealing with. I even just like giggled through it. <laughs> she was like, "Ah, oh, rape! Oh, that's so exciting!" <laughs> it so was. It was. It was like, "Oh wow!" And I was like, "Oh wow! We have to we have to talk about this." Uh, but well, we have to shoot this first. <laughs> I mean, it was like you know, we started uh, a year years years of conversations. You know, I, I remember being in the uh uh belarus nominated the film uh to compete in the foreign language academy category and i so i lived with alina for two weeks in la and we were like fighting really hard about this issue <laughs> you know it's like we realized we were in such different um points of the spectrum you know that that like that you know and when i say it i mean like wow you know women in russia are are, are raised to believe oh you are your it's your own fault like there's a lot of victim blaming um 
you know, like, of course, like, you know, it's uh, your own fault that you ended up there. Um, and so, so which is, which is not exactly the case with the character that we portrayed, but I, you know, with Alina, we had to do a lot of, I had to do a lot of talking and thinking, <laughs> thinking together through, through this issue. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, because it's, it, your, your actors are not always coming to it. Um, they have their own values and it might, they're not always, um, they don't always match up with the film. So it's like, you have to have a lot of conversations. But for me, I knew I never wanted to show the sexual violence. I wasn't interested in showing that. Um, we don't need to see that for many reasons, I think. And, uh, but I was more interested in like the, the fallout of that. What does, a, what does an action yeah. like that, the ripple effect that that causes? And if you think about how often something like that happens, and I put a magnifying glass on sort of what, what the, the ripples were from just that one act, can you imagine in the world when we think of all the people um, of any gender who have gone through something like that, the ripple effect in their life and how that affects somebody else? Um, so I was more interested on that, like the consequences of, of, of a heinous uh, patriarchal uh, act of oppression, like uh, sexual abuse um, or uh, sexual violence. And, uh, but I didn't want to show it. I was more interested in what the, what the conversations were between the girls after. And actually Lou, you know, and there was a scene where Lou talked about her own experience with that. It was very much supposed to be part of the film, but when we screened a test screening, some, a lot of people thought that she was talking about an experience with her mom's boyfriend and that became a complicated, mm -hmm. it became problematic in a different way. So we had to cut it out, but it, which is too bad because I wanted to kind of show that they both had gone through something like that and that they were had an understanding of each other because of that. But um, yeah, the, the weird thing though is after the film screened, some men said to me I, in a gross way, they said, I wish you should have shown the sexual assault and I oh my god Jasmine I had the same experience they like wanted more of it they're like I don't believe it happened because you didn't show me you didn't show me enough of it it was just like and it was such a gendered comment that disturbs me and I think it just goes to show you why we don't show that in our in both of our films why we don't show it because there is still a lot of people who get pleasure from women being uh violated and uh, to me, that was very, a, a very disturbing thing to learn. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that I didn't, uh, for, for people to feel like they could get some sort of like pleasure, sick pleasure out of that. I, and I can't even believe people tell us as filmmakers, say that comment to us as filmmakers. Even that in and of itself is, is an act of oppression, I think. Anyway. <laughs> It was it went dark. It went a, a, a dark. century, yeah, a century of conditioning your know, the audiences. Yeah, with the, you know, with the male gaze. I mean, that's. It. I mean, yeah. what what do, you, what do you expect? Yeah, yeah. I it was, it's it's fascinating to hear your experience. Yeah, I battled that comment in a lot of focus screenings, and uh, and yet I was like, okay, I just didn't even shoot that much. But uh, one of my producers literally said that, like, he described the scene he wanted to see. Um, uh, and in such graphic detail that I thought he was, I mean, it could have been like in an, an insane porn video. Um, and once this producer hung up, his his assistant, who was a woman, was like, "I'm so sorry for my boss. I'm so sorry for my boss." <laughs> you know, <laughs> disregard his notes. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of uh, you know, wow. we are so used to these images, like that we want to see it. It's almost like uh, you know, I mean, I mean, irreversible. You know, if you are, you know, like. You, the, after, after that scene it's almost like um i don't know you know i don't know if you remember um remember the this this film early 2000s where there was a you know i think it was seven or nine minutes like a very graphic uh, rape scene uh by the by the french director what's his name orla do you remember who made the reversible no uh gaspar noe gaspar oh. noe of yeah. course who else would uh, would have uh, in a, you know insanely fun rape? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I think it says more about them than it does about us. You know what I mean? I think that's like part of me making the film is like realizing. It, to me, it was like to hold up a mirror to certain people to be like yeah. your judgment on these women, what you think about these women, might say more about you than it says about the film. And I think that what I wanted people to do is sort of examine their own reactions. 
Um, I think in some cases that ex I was expecting too much uh, and I just kind of got these weird comments, but yeah, it was a learning experience to go through for sure as a filmmaker. <laughs> it makes me think about what I'm writing next and how I want to approach it, uh, which is just, that's just a part of the filmmaking process is you make mistakes as a filmmaker in public and with people um, interacting with you and you're, you're learning about your artistic process with hundreds of other people. <laughs> It's, it's strange, but it's part of what you signed up for as a filmmaker. So I think we'll start our Q&A. Um, we have a question uh, from Morgan, which is, um, if you're looking to build your circle of creators, the group of people to work with, as you talked about earlier, would you recommend film festivals as a good place to build that circle if you're attending as an audience member? I don't know if that's the greatest place to start. I don't think film festivals actually are a good place to, there, there's a lot of parties. I mean, there's probably networking events that you can go to, um, but I think you have to kind of look within your city and see if there's, or, or town, and see if there's any um, like creative groups or like, um, like I, I'm, I'm biased because I think of Toronto. Toronto has a lot of those. Uh, so I'm not sure where this person's based, but if there's any sort of like artistic community there, I think it's better to go that way. Film festivals can be very, like a lot of alcohol, a lot of drinking, a lot of partying. Um, I think it's good to see, if you want to go see films and then contact the filmmakers who you liked, if you like their films, if you go to a shorts program, and you're like, wow, I really like this person's film. You can maybe, if shorts are so much more accessible, you can maybe speak to the filmmaker after or email them after and ask them if they can, if you want to like talk to them about it. But um, I wouldn't rely on necessarily networking events and parties as a way to find your, your group of people. Um, I'm just going to chime in. I agree with everything Jasmine said. I think you have to have a short film to at least be uh, uh, you know, find your people, you know, how do you find your tribe? Um, so it's, it's, you know, that I did have an experience last year at Atlanta, actually, where I met some short filmmakers and we, uh, and some documentary filmmakers, and we have a little gang that we keep up on WhatsApp. Uh, but that required us sharing uh, each uh, with our own, our work with each other. You know, if I didn't have work to show, I think it would be very hard to like, you know, have that glue uh that that united us together so when you're just starting out i think these collectives like uh, there's a brooklyn filmmakers collective that i really like um film fatals uh, there's a women film, women's film organization that's global i think these are really helpful um uh and just i mean even this even this what we're doing right now that's also a community you know a community to 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 have and uh, a virtual community to be connected to that's just you know inspiring um so if there's like one piece of advice that you wish you knew before you made your first feature what would it be mm. i think i may i think there's lots of things you'll make uh, mistakes on um there's no way i think i needed to make those errors to learn to fully learn so it's hard to say like what would I go back and do? I mean, I think again, like the things that I made that I wish I did differently still were le were lessons I needed to learn. So I don't know. What about do you know, Daria? What you I don't know. Uh I don't know. Just have more faith uh that things will work out or not work out. <laughs> um so, so you know, I guess uh I you know some uh, I wish I trusted my producers more, but then uh, um, there's certain certain collaborations uh, that worked out for me, certain collaborations that didn't. Uh, um, like uh, I really had a hard time with uh, um, with an art uh, with a production designer, um, you know, and, and I think like that's one thing uh, where I should have listened to my producers and hired someone locally. I really had like this like grand scheme in mind that I could get someone from St. Petersburg or Moscow, but that just wasn't working out for me. So I lost two. And then I was so close to the shooting. So that's like a very specific one, you know, sometimes, you know, listen to the people who have more experience. Uh, but then also, you know, if you're doing something like what I was doing, which nobody has done before, like this very complicated uh, 
uh, co-production, but the very low budget. Um, um, like, you know, it also worked out that I only listened to myself. <laughs> that also was a plus, but, uh, so I, just overall, you know, that, you know, you're just so stressed out. Uh, and I feel like if you to, to work out a way to lower the stress level, uh, in, it could be by delegating to people or just, just, you know, rely on your team more. Uh, don't take on everything onto yourself, which I think what happens, you just feel like you're responsible for everything. And, uh, um, so that's my advice <laughs> to myself, to myself, you know, <laughs> four years ago, three years ago. <laughs> um, I mean, you guys were talking a bit about depicting patriarchal violence. And I guess I'm wondering about something that's sort of related to the, the flip side, which is about if how you thought about sort of creating kind of, I guess, sort of like feminist images. I mean, something that um, Ashley Connor and Catherine Lutz talked about when we were talking to them about working as cinematographers is how they want to sort of create like new ways of filming and like sort of feminist images as part of their work. And I'm wondering if that's something that you thought about or how you talked about that with your cinematographer. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, if there's a male gaze and therefore there's a female gaze and what does that mean? But, uh, and obviously it's, uh, it has to be associated with some kind of new language, right? Because anything that's if patriarchy it's not just patriarchy it's just like you know the the most uh the most prevalent view uh, uh that on on women or representation we see we see on screen so how do you dismantle it how do you deconstruct the 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 language that's most common uh so i mean it just you have to be really yeah experimental creative but um you know it could be done in so many different ways and i i feel like anything that deviates from from mainstream is already is already a plus is already female gaze um so i don't know if we like conceptually you know talked so much with uh, with carolina with my carolina costa my dp about subverting this gaze but we were just uh you know we were just trying to figure out like what's uh what's the story what's the most authentic way to say it because i mean ultimately and jasmine and i are already representing this <laughs> the female gaze by default in a way yeah yeah i think i think like patriarchy like i said before can sink its way into um anybody's mind no matter you know we've seen films by women before that are misogynistic like that's possible um i think you have to kind of think about that a lot like I, I didn't, I think like, if you're questioning it already in the writing, I think you're, you're kind of thinking about it as you're shooting or setting up your shots. Like an example would be like Chantel gives a guy, like uh, her friend a lap dance on the beach. Like, but how, we're like, how do we shoot this that empowers her? It's not from his gaze, right? It's not, we're not putting the camera where he is watching her and like, you know, like we're kind of getting close to her. It's her moment. It's she's she finds it empowering for herself to dance it's 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 not necessarily just for him it's for her to feel like she feels sexy she feels good doing it um so it's like how do you film that whereas maybe you know like we didn't we kept the camera often like above her uh like um waist kind of like you're not really seeing below that that changes things so it's like those are just and if 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 Catherine was further back I I immediately you're just immediately you see something you're like oh this reminds me of something I don't like so you're like okay let's move the camera like I think those just instinctually reframing and being like this doesn't feel right why does not not feel right oh it's because this is a male gaze shot okay let's let's put it somewhere else Jasmine that's amazing I love that scene I loved how it was shot and I definitely felt I definitely felt with her and uh, I felt empowered even though it was like it was a risky but it was like I felt like wow it was fun it was Good. fun to be there. Like it was her moment and she was in control. That was like yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Good. Uh, so one last question from Lisa. Um, she's wondering if you guys have thoughts about shooting digitally versus on film stock. Oh, I would love to shoot on film one day. Uh, I have shot on 16, but that was a long time ago. And there were some, uh, you know, short film school exercises. <laughs> like very early on um uh unfortunately it's like it's more of a budget question uh i mean film is amazing it's like a great uh, great tech has great texture um and you could do so much but um um ultimately uh like 
you know, we are in a world where digital also looks pretty good. You could do interesting things with it. It could serve the story well. Um, so I, I feel like for now I'm, <laughs> I'm in the world of digital. <laughs> But I love, I mean, I have, um, I have the a next script that's also somewhat autobiographical um, that um, I, you know, in my, in my parallel reality, I am shooting on 35. <laughs> yeah, I have the same thoughts as you, Daria. It's always comes down to a budget question. Like, I would have loved to shoot firecrackers on 16 millimeter. I've shot the short on 16, 16 millimeter, but I think you have to be honest about what you're coming up against as a challenge. Like for me, I was working with all non-union actors who have not done anything before. If you know that, I think it would be a disservice to you to shoot on film because you're not going to be able to do like a number of takes. You might get one or two takes max with, with, with film. With, with firecrackers, sometimes in some scenes, I was doing 13, 14 takes. And that's not because I'm a David Fincher, like, let's do. It's more like people just didn't remember their lines. They got nervous. They forgot their lines. We had to do it 14 times for them to, to get a line out. So you, I think you have to be like, think about what you're, what you're coming up against and then be realistic because it's a lot better to have a film that like, it's not as beautiful as, as 35 millimeter, but you have a good performance, then nobody's gonna, you know, that's, that's what really matters at the end of the day more than anything. But um, if you have access to like a Meryl Streep or people like that who can hit it, right? Like you can get one or two takes, you know you're gonna have a usable take, then yeah, maybe you can start thinking, or like if you have a film that's a short film that's maybe like not a lot of dialogue and you're gonna rehearse it a lot and you know you can get it, then take definitely take that risk. But um, I think it's just like, think about the parameters uh, that you have going into it. Jasmine, absolutely, I, I, I agree. I'm so curious. So when you had that many takes and you have this like, you know, really long takes that sometimes people don't hit their marks because they're not uh, experienced actors, did you feel like you spend more in the edit room longer than, than, than you would expect uh, for cutting a feature? Oh yeah. Yeah. We were, it was a puzzle because I didn't shoot traditional coverage. Um, even though I, I, I know how to do that for me, it was um, it was a choice I made that I didn't want to like restrict the actors to like, they did have to kind of be in the same area, but I wasn't like, okay, now you go here and you pick up this item. I let them like, they change every, every take was a little different. So yeah, the editing took several months uh, cause it was a puzzle. It was, it was more like, do we have the, the best option? So like some of those months was go were going back, trying out different things that we hadn't tried and then being like, oh no, we had the better take before. So like, it was such a, it was such a puzzle to edit that film, but I think, I don't regret doing it the way I did it. Um, I don't think I'll do another film in the same way, <laughs> but I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I tried it out. Can you tell us what you guys are working on at the moment, if you're working on something? Um, I have a number of number of projects and I'm seeing like what's, what's gonna go. Um, um, I have my, my ultimate, my ultimate passion right now is um, um, a script um, is a biopic about a radical feminist group called Femin who came up with this gesture of taking off their shirt and uh, writing on their bodies. Uh, um, um, they're from Ukraine. They still exist. It's a global movement and it's kind of their or origin story of um, sort of organizing in Ukraine and then becoming political refugees and being kicked out to Paris. Um, and so we have a version of the script, but it's, uh, it's vast. It's like 150 pages. It's really, it's really, it's really wild, but, uh, we are submitting it for, um, for funding right now, um, for production funding. So hopefully next year. Yeah. How many pages? 150. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, I thought you said 800. I was like, what? oh, no, 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 no. No, I am looking at like, oh, God, it's like a two and a half hour, three hour movie. I really, I need to figure out how to make it shorter, but it's complex. You know, it's an ensemble piece and it's about the movement. It's about women coming together and falling apart and has all these emotional beats and then beats of the movement itself. It's vast. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds, that sounds like an awesome movie. I, I want to see that movie. 
Um, I also similarly have a 200 page script first draft. <laughs> It's so all the first when you first start writing scripts, they're always too long and then you got to cut them back or whatever. But um, I'm working on a feature that's like about like inspired by the by my relationship with my father who passed away like six years ago. But it's not it's loosely based on me. It's not a I wouldn't say it's um, autobiographical at all, but it it's about an Iranian immigrant family who lives in North America post uh, 9-11. And uh, the the uh, exploring issues of freedom again, but also um, the idea of assimilation, how like the, the father is trying to assimilate as well as the daughter who's a teenager at the same time and how those stories mirror each other. And to me, it's like a love letter to our immigrant parents who sacrificed everything for um, us as millennials to like live, live the dreams that we are able to live. So yeah, I mean, I've only done one draft, so we'll see where that goes. And then I also, like Daria, I also direct TV and do uh, music videos now, which is kind of new. So all different types of things. But I, as you learn, you kind of have to have a bunch of things on, 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 on the stove because you never know what's going to go and what's not going to go. Well, thank Just, you. I'm excited. I'm excited to see. I want to see your, <laughs> like, you know, strands of your family on screen. Yeah. It would be yeah. really, really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you both so much. This has been such a wonderful discussion. Um, uh, so this is, will be um, on YouTube. And I know that you guys are both quite active on Instagram if you want to look up uh, Jasmine and Daria on uh, line we'll put we'll be posting this on our uh, website and we'll include some show notes including uh, where to find them on Instagram um, so thank you so much and um, we hope you'll tune thank in you next so week for having us thank you yes thank you guys thank you this was great this was a great conversation yeah, yeah thanks all right um, and we'll be sending out uh, emails to everyone who watched with where to stream the films as well Yes. 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 Cool. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.